as he has done in the past. So cheers, Femi. Now, we are moving on to another banger talk here. This is going to be from Ricky Allardyce, who should be somewhere in the audience. There he is over there. Now, we're going to be talking about geopolitics. We're going to be talking about Bitcoin as a mechanism to undermine geopolitics. And I'm actually going to read the blurb that was provided because it did not make sense to me when I first read it. So, parallel institutions and self-determined communities can defend themselves against the battle of titans taking place between the global south and NATO by adopting Bitcoin. It feels like the plot of some new Bitcoin movie. I'm ready for it, Ricky. Are you ready for it? Are you guys ready for it? Come on, guys, adopting Bitcoin. Let's go. Ricky Allardyce takes the stage. Well, I'm not ready for it. I thought my talk was in an hour, so. <laughs> so. All right, guys. Hi, my name's Ricky. Please excuse my slide deck. I spent a lot of time prepping for this conference and not so much my talk, but here we are. All right, so the nature of my talk today is aimed particularly at the parallel institutions of South Africa um, and how to use Bitcoin as a defense mechanism against geopolitics and how to be the remora fish, really, and use Bitcoin to your advantage. So who am I? Um, I'm a Bitcoin entrepreneur. I've owned a couple of Bitcoin companies. I'm a co-organizer of the conference here and I'm a very concerned South African citizen. I um, own and run a local podcast called By the Horns, which is focusing on South Africa, or, or uh, a Bitcoin podcast about South Africa, really. And I used to own a company called Bitvice, which was South Africa's first direct to self-custody OTC desk. Um, and we also built a pretty cool product called Satstacker, which lets you accumulate Bitcoin on-chain directly to your own self-custody as well. Um, this was kind of before Lightning was really taking off so much. Um, but yeah, let people accumulate Bitcoin on a weekly basis. And currently, I own a company called Bitcoin Only, consultancy firm, and uh, focus on security and getting people um, into self-custody. So, with that out of the way, what is a parallel institution? They are community organizations that advocate for the member base and build alternative structures to government services. Essentially, they're the guys who pick up the pieces when government steps up. Now, for those of you who are foreigners, you might not know this, but the South African government is extremely inefficient and ineffective, and they have dropped the ball all over the place. And as a result, for the last 20, 30 years, we've had parallel institutions pop up to fill in the void. This ranges from filling potholes to fixing water and sanitation to all the way to fixing electricity. So they are an integral part of South African society and kind of the glue that's holding things together presently. So who have we got? If you guys were here this morning, you would have seen Russ Lamberti's talk from Sarkalicha. Sarkalicha is a business chamber. Um, they cater to their members, which are business owners. And off their own website here, you can see they address the harm of state failure on our communities, starts with having a strong purpose-built state-proof vehicle capable of developing scalable solutions to state failure and disorder, mounting comprehensive legal challenges and coordinating concrete solutions to shared problems. This vehicle is Sarkalicha. It's a lot of words for saying, they rally business to hold government accountable and to create alternatives. Another parallel institution that's here today is the Institute of Race Relations. Now, they've been going for almost 100 years. John, the CEO, is somewhere here in the crowd. Their aim is to make South Africa free and prosperous. Now, they put forward the rights of the individual. Um, they're a classical liberal think tank. And they really focus on research, policy solutions, and advocating for the ideas of classical liberalism. And they, like I said, they've been going for almost 100 years. The third one, unfortunately, who couldn't make it today is AfriForum. AfriForum has got about 315,000 rate-paying members. Um, they bring in upwards of 20 million rand a month in member contributions. And, I mean, as you can see, they marshal over 10,000 volunteers to really fill in the gaps where government has, uh, has dropped the ball. Um, their main aim here is to keep South Africa free, safe, and prosperous. So what is the role of the parallel institution in South Africa? Well, there's kind of big picture macro things going on, and one of the themes over the last few years is multipolarity. South Africa traditionally has been within the Western sphere of influence, but that is changing. We're gravitating eastward towards a multipolar world order after centuries of being aligned with the West. Um, we are the S in BRICS. Um, we declared neutrality um, on the Russia-Ukraine war, 
Uh, we took a neutral stance. Obviously, the West didn't like that. Allegedly, we supplied weapons to Russia. That hasn't been proven yet, but there was a lot of fuss about it. We were also gray listed by the Financial Action Task Force, um, another Western institution. And some of you might have seen this. South Africa uh, took Israel to court um, on charges of genocide. Wherever you fall on that debate, the fact of the matter is they did it. And this obviously is going against France, um, the Great Britain, and the US, and Germany who are supporting them in that. So clearly gravitating east, not west anymore. The next thing to look at is what's going to happen to the value of the rand. Czar devaluation is the most likely outcome for the next foreseeable future. This is the rate from 1955 um, versus the USD to where we are now. So going from essentially parity to the US dollar to 20 rand to the US dollar. And on top of that, inflation of fiat currencies is also the most likely outcome. So as you can see, the dollar's purchasing power has eroded dramatically over the, you know, the last 60 years as well. So it's not just the rand is devaluing, it's that the thing that everything is tethered to is devaluing as well. Deindustrialization is another big theme that's happening in South Africa. And this is mainly because of our electricity uh, supply being intermittent and uh, we're actually producing less power than we were before. The graph on the left, you can see our energy consumption is actually dropping. So this means people are using less power. And this is not because they're environmentally friendly, this is because there's less power available. Simultaneously, you can also see that our unemployment rate from 2003 till 2022 has increased by about 15%, and this is the official rate. Unofficially, we're seeing about 50% unemployment with 70% youth unemployment. This is, a, this is a major challenge. We have the highest unemployment rate in the world, basically. Then there's political pressure on non-conformance. So individuals and minority groups who align west in South Africa will come under pressure. And for the parallel institutions who stand for things like uh, self-sovereignty, self-determination, primacy of the individual, this means that effectively you're going to come under pressure from the current government, which aligns towards communist ideology. So just to see where this has happened in the rest of the world, obviously there was the Hong Kong, uh, in Hong Kong the, the, the democratic protests are being clamped down on by the Chinese authorities. We've seen Russia clamp down and on dissidents in Russia. And in Nigeria, we've seen protests, anti-police brutality protests being clamped, on, uh, clamped down on as well. However, um, Western intel agencies are not innocent in this, and they've been driving color revolutions all around the world for years, and this causes clampdowns when those color revolutions fail. So for the people who align with those color, color revolutions, when they don't work out, they come into persecution. So obviously we know America's been doing this for quite a while. Um, starting in, as you can see, this article is 19 years old, in 2004 in Kiev, they started the Orange Revolution. Then the Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan uh, in 2005. This is something they've been doing for quite some time. The point I'm making is that if you find yourself in the middle of this, it's not, it's not a good place to be. So, what have we learned here? If you are a parallel institution or an individual who doesn't align with the government, BRICS is obviously not going to save you, and the West is not going to save you. Western governments pay lip service to these principles of self-determination, self-governance, sovereignty, uh, freedom, but they will only uh, support you so far as it furthers their own agenda. And um, what the parallel institutions should look at doing is taking a, book, a leaf out of the Bitcoin book and decentralize to create continuity of your institution under adversarial conditions. So what we've seen with parallel institutions in South Africa is they've been very successful. But at some point, if you are successful, you're gonna show up the government and you will come into scrutiny and pressure and they are gonna apply, they'll, they'll apply pressure where they can. And the most obvious choke point is your bank account. This is not just me postulating, this happened in Canada, this happened to Nigel Farage recently. And this happened to someone called Iqbal Suave, who most people in South Africa have no love for. But if it can happen to him, remember, this man has not been convicted of any crimes. He's had most of his bank accounts shut down by all of the big banks. This is a billionaire, by the way, for foreigners who don't know. If they can do it to him, they can do it to you. So, what can you do? Well, you can keep building parallel institutions. Please, don't stop. We love the fact that you're doing it. However, I would suggest 
looking at open source tools that are available to you. Because open source tools are very, very hard to shut down. And if you wish to remain as censorship resistant, censorship resistant as possible, it might be a good idea to look at some open source tools. And then the most important thing here is to protect and grow both your individual and your community's wealth. Because the wealthier you are as an organization, the more you can do in society, the more you can achieve. Um, I know this is a contentious issue in the Bitcoin community, but uh, money may be a store of energy. Um, I know this triggers Carl particularly hard, <laughs> but to some point this is true, to some level, you know? So basically make money and save your money. And if you're saving your money in the RAND, you might have problems over the long term. So what can you do? Remove yourself from the czar as a store of value. South African RAND is a shitcoin, guys. It really is. <laughs> in terms of other shitcoins, it's not so bad, but nonetheless. Um, so what you should possibly look at doing is building on rails that allow for the censorship resistant store of value and medium of exchange. Obviously, I'm hinting at Bitcoin here. Because you could save in the US dollar, or even in US dollar stable coins, but dollar sanctions may be levied against South Africa. Gray listing is obviously the start of this. We may be cut off to Western markets under sanctions. This happened to Russia. If it can happen to Russia, obviously it can happen to us. And this is where Bitcoin comes in, and this is where stable coins come in, and this is where things that are like stable sats are really great innovation because you don't have to trust some stable coin issuer. Um, you can just trust Bitcoin. So using the tools that are available to you to educate yourself and your community on how to opt out of the czar, I'm not suggesting to parallel institutions that you move over to a Bitcoin standard today. That's unrealistic. What I am suggesting, though, is that Bitcoin is money for enemies. And if the US is using it, and the Russians are using it, and the North Koreans are using it, it might be a good idea to become a Bitcoin remora fish and just you know, follow on the big shark um, and, and use this tool to preserve your wealth and your purchasing power in your own community. So as we know, Russia is mining Bitcoin. I don't know if any of you guys noticed when Nord Stream pipeline blew up, there was a big increase in hash rate. Don't know what that was about, but I just noticed it. El Salvador, tiny little country in Central America, has been buying one Bitcoin per day. They get it. And the US has taken a different approach to acquiring Bitcoin. They just steal it, but it works. <laughs> So what are the tools available to you? Uh, really, guys, embracing open source tech is a really uh, good way to go about this. For example, something I was thinking about is a education system that someone like AppriForum might start bringing out, uh, a curriculum. Open source the curriculum so that anyone can download that curriculum and do homeschooling at home. This is how you, <clears throat> you win the culture war. Because most foreigners here won't know, but the South African education system is, is horrific. Um, and, and if you can opt out of that and build your own, um, that's a great way to keep your community educated. But if you register as a private school or you register your own curriculum, the government will just regulate you and, and stop you from doing that. But if you make it open source, it's very hard for them to police free speech, which is what open source is. Something that makes Bitcoin easy for your members to use, that abstracts away, and this ties into what Femi was saying, abstracts away the difficulty Self-custodial lightning is difficult. You know, it's not, it's not that easy to use. Um, I think the guys had a, a really good uh, session this morning with the Fedi workshop for how you can use Fedi and Fedi Mints um, to have uh, lightning wallets for your members. And this is really, really useful because if you can make lightning easy for your members to use, then, you know, it just makes that onboarding process a lot easier. They're not going to get rug pulled. Um, it, it makes life a lot easier. Multi-sigs are great, especially at an organizational level, because you can distribute your keys, and someone like Sarklicha, for example, they already have a Bitcoin strategy, they already have a multi-sig in place. This is a great way for them to accumulate donations in Bitcoin, and the community doesn't have to worry that they're gonna rug, one director is gonna rug pull the, the community and run off with the Bitcoin, because using a multi-sig. BDC Pay Server, I'm a huge fan of what they're doing there. This makes receiving payments obviously much easier, and it's open source. Communications are key, and NOSTA has not been embraced yet by this community. But I think this becomes vital, because if you can't communicate, how can you expect to transact? 
So having a free and open communication rail is vital. Um, and then what Liquid is doing is great. I really like what uh, Ben was doing the, the Aqua workshop earlier. This makes it a lot easier for, for uh, so you don't have to interact with Lightning. You can have self-custodial Liquid Bitcoin. Um, I mean, obviously the jury's out and, 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 and how people feel about, about Liquid being a federation. It's obviously not on-chain Bitcoin. But the point here is how do you make this easy so you can adopt, you can get mass adoption within your community. Sarkalicha has got 12,000 members, businesses, the, the biggest businesses in the country. Uh, AfriForum's got over 200,000 rate paying members. Uh, IRR's got over 12,000 members. You need to make it as easy as possible for these members to onboard to Bitcoin. So getting them to set up their own self custody wallets, sure, that'll work for five, 10% of them, but you need to make it easy. Um, community custody, something like Pediment, this is really important because it's much easier for them to trust, your, your members to trust you than it is for them to trust some faceless uh, exchange who have a history of rug pulling people. <clears throat> and finally, I think what is important is that every parallel institution should develop their own Bitcoin strategy that is appropriate to them. How do you engage with the community about it? Education is key here. You can't just roll out a Bitcoin strategy and say to your members, cool guys, we're on a Bitcoin strategy, on a, a Bitcoin standard now. Most of your members are 65-year-old Afrikaans ladies. They're just not going to buy into it like that. You've got you to ease them in. Um, so, you, yeah, you've got to wine and dine them first and teach them about Bitcoin and why it's important. You don't have to, to sell people on the idea of inflation. They get it. They understand that the rand is devaluing. They've seen a decrease in their purchasing power. Um, you, so you don't have to sell them on that. You just need to sell them on, look, guys, we are taking an alternative approach here. We're not leaving the RAND and our RAND bank account behind, but we are investigating Bitcoin, and you start the conversation. Then you could, could push how to accumulate Bitcoin as savings. This might trigger Femi for a bit here, but it just having a store of value um, in a country which has 15% inflation rate year on year um, is quite important. Um, and especially having it in a country where you don't necessarily have access to foreign markets. Not every South African can buy S&P 500 or get access to US dollars. So Bitcoin is a really simple way for you to get offshore bank accounts, offshore exposure, as it were. Thirdly is how do you receive your monthly member contributions in Bitcoin? This is the most important point to me because if you become a stick in the eye of government because you make them look so bad because their schools are falling apart that they built and they're over budget and they, people are stealing money and you're building schools on time, on budget, FYI, um, Solidaritat, which is part of the, sorry, Afri Forum is part of the Solidarity Movement. They built a technical college and the largest single contribution they got from their members was 10 rand. They built this college that was worth multi-millions rands. They built it on time, on budget, with the largest contribution being 10 rand. This obviously shows the government up, makes them look very bad. So if you can build an alternative rail to keep doing the work that you're doing, um, I would suggest doing it on something like Bitcoin because sooner or later, like I said, they're going to shut down your bank account. And then all of the hard work you've done for 30 years or 20 years or five years, however long, is going to be for nothing because you can't transact. So uh, part of your strategy is like, how do you lay these foundations now? I don't suggest you do it immediately, but start laying the foundations, start having the conversation with your members. So when the time is right, you guys can make the switch and you don't get left high and dry with your bank account being shut down and uh, hyperinflation hitting and your members have no way to pay you in Bitcoin. So food for thought for the parallel institutions. Um, yeah, I think uh, the time to start thinking about this is now. Thank you very much. That was great, man. That was really good. Fantastic. Another really thought-provoking talk. Ricky, what was the name of that group that they survived off 10 Rand donations? That's an amazing story. What's it called? Solidarity. Solidarity. If I Google that, Solidarity 10 Rand, it'll come up. Yeah. That's such a strong sort of advert as well for Nostra Zaps. You know, you were saying how Nostra's not quite got into South Africa. 10 Rand is your average Zap. I think that's like 696 Sats or something. So yeah, there you go. Get solidarity onto Nostra, and there you've got Nostra adoption in South Africa. That was fantastic. We're actually going to take our break.